Hi everybody and welcome back to Outremer Gaming. I'm Count Beaumont aka Matt. I'm very excited to be back with some more videos about Rome Total War the board game. Brought to you again from my garage and not from a Sega HQ. But I'm very lucky that the designer of the game, Simon Hall, is a good friend and he lives just up the road. So he's come round today to do some videos to keep your juices flowing until the game comes out about how to play the game, go through all the different phases. I think he's going to go through the combat system and what have you. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Simon and uh, introduce video number one. Hello, I'm Simon Hall. I'm the uh, primary designer of Rome Total War, the board game. Um, I'm actually going to do you some tuition videos. Uh, the, the game here is designed to give a deep experience that actually mirrors to a fair degree the many things in the world leading computer game that many of us know and love. I, I played it traveling all around the world um, for over a decade. It was my constant travel companion. But the game itself is not complex. It gets its sophistication through the combination of a lot of individual simple phases which interconnect in such a plethora of different ways that you get a, a massive variety of games and possible outcomes. So in this series of videos, I'm going to try and show you how that works. So I'm going to be working through what would be found in the rule book. None of us really like reading rule books, so I can hope I can short navigate some of that and hope you to learn the phases very quickly by just watching me in action in a scenario. The scenario I'm going to use is a two-player game. You can play this as a two-player game. Um, they're very straightforward, Rome versus Carthage game. Um, this is basically representing the first Punic War in what I've set up. It's going to be a fight over Sicily. I've set the board up so it represents the board at the end of turn one, at the end of the, the first turn, ready for turn two. The Greeks and the Barbarians are non-players, which means you can trade with them, you can invade their territories and steal their territories, but you can't do anything else. They're not going to do anything else in this particular game. So the action is all going to be focused around here. Let me give you a quick walk around the board. You'll have a top-down view, so you, you should be able to broadly see what I'm saying. So, in the course of turn one, what has Carthage done? In the course of turn one, Carthage has gone over and conquered Numidia. Um, it's come out here and conquered some extra territory there. Um, it's moved an army into Sicily, and it's got its fleet sitting in, in this part of the eastern Med, and it's, uh, it's nabbed a couple of areas here. So it will have sailed an army across, moved them across, and dropped them, dropped them back onto here, say. In its building phase, it's done a few bits. It's put a barracks here in Spain and a barracks there, which would allow it to recruit mercenaries from those two areas. We'll come to that and see that in action later. And it's put a market next to a port, which can help it with trade income. And it's gone and stuck one of its diplomats over in Athens. And it's done a little bit of work to make a bit of a treaty with them. So they're actually friendly on their chart. So over here, you can see friendly for the purple Greeks, neutral for the barbarian tribes, Rome, naturally an enemy already. If we add all of that up, you'll find they've got 20 gold when they raise money, so they've even got one victory point. Romans have taken a slightly different approach. Um, they've expanded outwards. They've kept their navies somewhere else. They've spent more money on building. They've built a barracks and walling in Rome, which basically means Rome is untakeable for the time being. They've put a couple of markets and lots of roads, which would help generate them income. Unfortunately, the grand total of that only gets them to 19, so they've missed by one from getting a victory point um, out of their money raising in that phase. And they've sent somebody up here to try and be peaceful with the barbarians, so Rome has got the barbarians as friendly, the Greeks neutral, and Carthage as enemy. They've each spent two things on the development chart. We again will come back to that later, but just to explain what they've done, the Romans have invested in getting Scorpios, so next time they can actually recruit Scorpios and They've also done road builder, which gets them a free road every time. How very Roman, good at building roads. Meanwhile, over here, the Carthaginians have invested in a trade fleet. They were a very naval-focused nation. And war elephants, so they could potentially recruit some war elephants next time in the spending phase. And we are ready to begin turn two. In case you couldn't see that very well, I'm just going to add Matt here who's helping to bring the camera a bit more local. And we'll just do a little tour of the board starting over here. So if we look at Spain over here, you can see the expansion. You can see the barracks in a mercenary area of Hispania there. If we work our way around to North Africa map, and just work our way around to the rest of Carthage, 
You see it's got an army here. That's the market, the navies, and then you can see all of the central bit of Rome here with the, the heavy duty defences of Rome. And we're ready to go. So this is phase one of every turn, and it's called the initiative phase. It's a short phase, but it can be a very important one. What we have is we have a set of cards, and the minimum you use is one to four. And every different nation is dealt one of these cards. So I'm going to just deal those out at random for my different nations. The two non-players are irrelevant. Whoever has the highest number on these cards gets to choose whether to go first and choose the direction of travel or whether to pass it to the next highest number and let them do it. And that decision can be really interesting as the game evolves. Let's see what they've got. They've got two and three. So Rome has got two, Carthage has got three. Carthage actually wants to go first, decide they want to go first. You can add gold to it and they've saved a couple of gold and they know the biggest number is four. So the way you do that is you either by bluffing or holding gold you declare your card like this. Declared, added gold. The other Roman player kept no gold, would declare, no added gold. And this would mean that this counts as five to two, which means Carthage, by spending the money, knowing nobody else had any, guaranteed themselves the choice. Now, they've got a choice, actually, of choosing to go first and get on with it, or actually passing it to Rome and making Rome go first so they can react. So that's an interesting decision in itself. But in this particular situation, Carthage are going to choose to go first because they want to pinch the rest of Sicily before the Romans get to interfere with it. That's the initiative phase. Now, if you're playing four player, it gets more interesting because Carthage could choose the direction of travel. So imagine Carthage has actually got the barbarian tribes as an ally. They may want the barbarian tri tribes to go before the Greeks go who are neutrals. Alternatively, they might want to go the other way and have the barbarian tribes go last to give them maximum opportunity to cause damage. So it's a very simple mechanism. It's very, very quick, but the decision-making involved can be quite critical as the game commences. First, very simple mechanism leads to lots of sophisticated thinking. Once you've got them, you can actually put them around the table showing the direction of travel. So whoever's got the initiative does that and the other cards are turned over to show the direction of travel, which matters not in this particular game. And they've spent their two gold, so they go back into the bank like good old Monopoly. <laughs> 